Hello. I am really grateful to the workshop organizers for the chance to be part of this, and I am excited to talk to you all about evapotranspiration, ecosystem energy balance, and land cover change. So I'm focusing the talk on ET for a few reasons. First, uh, it is a flux that really lies squarely at the nexus of ecosystem water, energy, and carbon cycles. Um, it's also a process that we have really rich information about um, from our global networks of flux towers. Um, I'm also going to focus this talk on issues surrounding land cover heterogeneity and change uh, for a few reasons. The first is methodological. Um, many of you may know that one of the fundamental assumptions of eddy covariance theory is that you have a quasi-infinite, homogeneous, and flat fetch surrounding your tower. Um, and this is an assumption that is really hard to realize in practice. What you see here is a uh, picture from a site in southern Arkansas where my lab operated a tower for a couple of years. Uh, which is the closest I've personally come to living the eddy covariance dream of uh, infinite fetch. Um, that was at least until our tower ended up three feet underwater, uh, but that's a different story. Um, in reality, most towers, um, including the Morgan Monroe State Forest Flux Tower pictured here, are surrounded by landscape that is quite heterogeneous, right? And that processes occurring over here may, through land atmosphere interactions, be informing what we sense on the tower. Uh, whether or not we're considering those interactions, right? And then another reason to think about land cover uh, change in particular relates to what I view as a really exciting research opportunity uh, for our community surrounding natural climate solutions, um, which are managed alterations to the land surface um, designed to either enhance carbon uptake or reduce emissions of uh, greenhouse gases from ecosystems, okay? Uh, these are not a panacea for climate change, and we shouldn't even be talking about them unless we are drastically reducing uh, emissions of greenhouse gases from industry. Uh, but provided that's happening, um, these are sometimes attractive. Um, they are part of most pathways to net zero, and they have important co-benefits for air and water quality, soil health, and biodiversity. Okay. There is an awful lot of momentum surrounding nature-based or natural climate solutions um, in legislative bodies where they tend to have a lot of bipartisan support among conservation groups that are really enthusiastic about the co-benefits. And also um, in the private sector where among other things, I think that a lot of startups and other new organizations sense an opportunity to make some money. Um, however, this idea is proceeding amidst quite a bit of uncertainty. Um, the size of these error bars suggests that there's an awful lot of uncertainty surrounding the carbon uptake potential, which I'm not really going to talk about today. Uh, where I am going to focus my energy is on these so-called biophysical impacts of natural climate solutions, right? This idea that an alteration to the land surface designed to affect carbon cycling will also affect energy and water cycling in ways that may or may not be favorable um, from a climate perspective, but we really don't have good frameworks to understand those impacts, okay? So where are we going from here? I'm going to begin with just a few cautionary notes about flux tower ET measurements um, for the uninitiated. Um, then I'm going to move into um, some questions about how land cover change affects evapotranspiration and temperature regimes. Um, I'm also going to address a few studies showing how land use and land cover can affect cloudiness and precipitation, right? So these are kind of local effects and these are more non-local effects. And then I hate to pass up an opportunity to talk about soil moisture and vapor pressure deficit. Um, so I'm going to end with a few thoughts in that spirit. All right. Um, but first, a pop quiz. Uh, do flux towers measure evapotranspiration? That's the question. What do you think? Maybe you think yes. Maybe you think no. Maybe you think this is a trick. Um, the answer is that in theory, yes, they do. Right? And sometimes, um, indeed, we are observing directly the ecosystem scale ET uh, with flux tower data. However, in practice, the technique relies on, on, on assumptions which are often invalidated, particularly at night or in heterogeneous or complex terrain. Thus, all flux tower records are filtered and gap filled right, with empirical or process based models. So anytime you're using tower data aggregated to daily, weekly, monthly or annual time scales, uh, that time series in, is informed by some measurements, right, and a, a fair amount of modeling, which is just something to keep in mind. Um, next, even for the quote-unquote good data, um, the past quality control filters, a lack of energy balance closure is a persistent problem that plagues the flux tower networks. Um, and how this is realized is that the tower measured net radiation typically substantially exceeds the sum of uh, latent heat flux, 
which is really ET, sensible heat flux and ground heat flux, okay? Um, and there's been an awful lot of work done to understand why. And there's been an awful lot of proposed hypotheses, and this is an incomplete list, um, uh, but it is a list of some of the potential explanations that seem to have the most traction right now. And a noteworthy thing about all three of these is that these are processes that involve interactions um, with the boundary layer, right? Um, and so it's possible that better characterization of boundary layer dynamics at flux tower sites can help us um, uh, confront this longstanding problem. You know, when it comes to flux tower data, I'm of the opinion that we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, but nonetheless, this is, this is a challenge that really would benefit from some resolution. So next, I want to move into uh, uh, the topic of how land cover transitions, and let's think specifically about reforestation here, might affect the surface energy balance. Um, so first, a quick review of mechanisms as we move from an ecosystem that has relatively uh, short vegetation to a forested ecosystem. One thing that will most certainly happen is that the albedo will be lowered, forests are darker, and this is a mechanism that alone will tend to promote warming of the surface. All right, so when I say surface, it's important to note that I mean the surface temperature, which is really the temperature at the interface between the canopy and the atmosphere, right? Not the temperature within the canopy, but really the temperature of the canopy skin, right? Um, so on the other hand, however, forests have higher sensible heat flux due to the fact that they are more aerodynamically rough, which is a mechanism that would lead to surface cooling because sensible heat flux transfers heat energy away from the surface into the air aloft. And then forests also use more water. They have higher ET, um, which is a process that also leads to surface cooling, right? So how a land cover tr transition like reforestation will affect surface temperature really reflects the interplay between these three mechanisms. But the important note that boundary layer dynamics really complicate the picture. And in particular, um, increases in boundary layer height can, for example, create more room in the atmosphere uh, for heat transferred away from the surface, okay? So we know some things. Um, we know that in boreal forests, the albedo effects dominate and the surface of forest tends to be warmer than nearby uh, short stature ecosystems, which is an undesirable biophysical impact from a climate perspective. In contrast, in the tropics, we know that the evaporative effects dominate and forest surfaces tend to be cooler, right? My lab group and a lot of other folks have done a lot of work over the past uh, few years understanding how these mechanisms uh, play out in the temperate zone. Um, and I'll show you some results on the next slide, but I think that everywhere we still have quite a bit of work to do to understand, right, um, how these surface cooling mechanisms play out over time scales that are shorter than a year. So, for example, within a season or even over the course of a day. And we certainly have a lot of work to do to understand the interplay between changes in surface temperature and changes in air temperature. Okay. Well, let's focus first on the relatively easier problem of surface temperature. Uh, flux towers are great for understanding uh, land cover changes on surface temperature because they measure all of the key terms in the energy budget so we can understand not only if temperature varies but also why. All right. So um, again thinking about reforestation, um, what I'm showing here are results from a study that leveraged six grassland forest site pairs across the eastern United States. So towers located close enough together um, that they experience the same macroclimate. Um, and this figure aggregates the results from those flux tower pairs um, into single, a, a single uh, data series. And what we find is that in the eastern United States during both summer and winter, the forests tend to be substantially cooler at the surface than nearby grasslands on the order of four to five degrees Celsius, but only in the daytime and not so much at night. Um, and in the summer, this cooling is driven by evaporative effects, whereas in the winter, it's driven by uh, sensible heat flux effects. Okay, um, so in the case of reforestation in the East United States, right here is an example of a favorable uh, biophysical impact. But that's surface temperature. What about the near surface air temperature, right, which is arguably the more climatically relevant variable, right? This is the temperature that, for example, we sense when we are outside. Um, understanding how land cover changes affect near surface air temperature is a much harder problem. It's harder conceptually. Uh, because here those boundary layer interactions become really important. It's also harder methodologically um, because we are somewhat data limited, right? We can observe land surface temperature from space, uh, but not so much near surface air temperature. Okay. So one thing we might be tempted to do, again, thinking about paired flux towers, 
is to compare air temperature measured at the top of a forest flux tower and the top of a grassland flux tower. Um, but this would be a bit of an apples to oranges comparison. Um, and that's because near the surface, within the roughness sublayer, uh, the canopy structure can exert really strong influence on the shape of the local scalar profiles, including temperature. Whereas above the roughness sublayer in the surface layer, uh, these profiles are much more predictable and logarithmic. Right? In grasslands, we typically escape the roughness sublayer at the top of our flux towers, but this is not typically true uh, for forest flux towers. Thus, if we compare air temperature measured here and here, uh, the biggest factor influencing our results is probably going to be the height of the uh, flux tower itself, right? which is not usually the mechanism we're most interested in. Um, so in a paper that came out last year, we explored some strategies for a more apples to apples comparison, um, looking at different metrics of air temperature, such as the aerodynamic temperature and temperature extrapolated into the surface layer. Um, what I can say is that uh, we sure would benefit um, from better characterization of temperature profiles into the surface layer, um, particularly at forested flux tower sites. Right, right now, that data gap is really limiting our understanding of how land cover changes affect air temperature, right? noting that air is, of course, uh, a fluid that gets evicted across the landscape, right? so really important for teleconnections and that sort of thing. Okay, uh, so we talked about energy balance, but of course land cover transitions can also affect the hydrologic cycle in other ways, for example, um, by predisposing um, um, uh, rainfall mechanisms, right? So I want to highlight just a couple of studies real quick that kind of get at this using flux tower data. Um, the first uh, came out a few years ago, and the objective of this paper was to understand how uh, southeastern U.S. pine plantations of different ages um, affected the likelihood of cloud formation and rainfall, uh, focused particularly on the likelihood of crossing between the lifting condensation level and the atmospheric boundary layer, right, which is a necessary precondition for cloud formation. And I point you to the paper to get all the details, but here's a quick summary. Um, what, what these authors found was that young and maturing pine plantations were very connected um, to the uh, uh, boundary layer dynamics, in particular the lapse rate for humidity, um, and uh, we're also sensitive to uh, soil moisture conditions, right? So that the young and mature pine stands had strong rainfall predisposition mechanisms, whereas a much older and less productive pine stand was much less coupled to the boundary layer and didn't have much of um, influence, right, on the evolution of these two heights. A similar study came out uh, just a couple of years ago out of Paul Stoy's lab, where here um, uh, this group is really looking at how changes in land management, in particular decreases of summer fallow period and increases in cropping generally, affect the probability of the crossing of the ABL on the lifting condensation la layer. Um, and what they found is that this likelihood of crossing has been increasing in time. Um, right, suggesting the potential for changes not necessarily to land cover, but just simply to land management um, can affect, again, the likelihood of, of precipitation. Okay. But one thing to note about all of these studies is that um, the boundary layer heights were modeled uh, using slab models, um, which introduces a substantial amount of uncertainty. So it's interesting to think about um, what we might be able to understand if we were more consistently measuring uh, boundary layer height. Right, together with, with uh, eddy covariance fluxes. Okay, and then with the time I have remaining, I want to um, spend, uh, uh, spend a few words on interactions between soil moisture and vapor pressure deficit, which are, is really a topic that has a lot of momentum right in the land atmosphere literature right now. Um, we, you know, the, the crux of the problem is that we know that both soil moisture and vapor pressure deficit uh, affect plants during drought, but through quasi-independent mechanisms. Um, so we need to be able to understand the influence of each in order to predict plant function into the future. And it's also worth noting that uh, the role of each in limiting uh, plant function differs for different species, bringing us back to those issues of land cover heterogeneity. Um, so you might notice this weird word up here, egg problems. Um, to try to make this a little bit sticky, I'm going to introduce three challenges using three analogies having to do with eggs. All right, so let's see how it goes. Um, the first is what I'm going to call the chicken and egg problem. Right, so you guys are probably familiar with the classic question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Um, so we might put a little twist on that and ask, uh, you know, as drought evolves, right, is it really driven by first an increase in vapor pressure deficit, which dries out the soil more quickly? 
or is it precipitated by a decrease in soil moisture, uh, which limits evapotranspiration and dries out the atmosphere, right? Um, many of you may have seen the study that came out earlier this year, um, which tends to come down in favor of uh, soil moisture limitations being the primary precipitating factor for drought evolution. Um, uh, really that drying soil uh, feeds back by amplifying temperature and humidity anomalies, All right? I thought this was a really nice paper, but it, it was a modeling study. So I think a really great challenge to some folks that might be in the audience here is to see who can show the data, right? That confirm the hypothesis that emerged from this modeling work. Okay, our next egg problem is the scrambled egg problem, right? And so regardless of which came first, soil moisture or VPD, uh, both affect plants differently and we need to be able to disentangle exactly how uh, plants respond to changes in each, okay? But this is really hard because over relatively long time scales, uh, these two drivers are very closely coupled, right? So it's all scrambled. Um, a couple of years ago, we published this study uh, that harnessed the fact that eddy covariance uh, tower records come in at a temporal resolution hourly over which soil moisture and VPD are largely decoupled, right? So that we can begin to fingerprint um, the action of each on things like surface conductance and evapotranspiration. Uh, we conclude that particularly in mesic biomes like eastern U.S. forests, uh, vapor pressure deficit limitations are actually predominant and will become more important in the future, okay? Uh, and there's been others that have done similar work using flux tower data or even sap flux data. Um, but this is, these are largely data-driven studies and we still have quite a bit of work to do uh, to understand how best to represent uh, these processes and models. And then the final egg problem, I'll call the undercooked egg problem. Uh, and, and, he, and here it is in a nutshell. We are often find ourselves in the position of doing things like relating evapotranspiration or carbon fluxes or other uh, plant response variables to gradients in soil moisture, right? Because that's what we tend to measure at our sites. Um, but this leaves out some really important information about the relationship between soil moisture and soil water potential, right? So this is sort of the, these are sort of half cooked analyses. Right, because soil water potential, the tension under which soil water is bound in the soil matrix, is really a much better predictor of plant available water. Right, and the relationship between soil water potential and soil moisture content is quite nonlinear. Note the log scale here. Right, and varies quite a bit as a function of soil texture and structure. Right, so you can have vastly different soil water potentials for the same soil moisture content. Right. And consequently, relationships like these relating ET to soil moisture content, which tend to be hyperbolic and nonlinear, have embedded within them, right, these water retention curves, the relationship between water potential and soil moisture. So we might hypothesize that if we simply switched out the x-axis here from soil moisture content to soil water potential, we might see relationships that are more linear and more coherent across sites. Right? So a few things to keep an eye out for here um, first, there's a paper coming out, hopefully soon, um, that sort of explains uh, uh, this idea in a bit more detail, um, so keep your eye out for that. And then uh, for the Ameriflex Water Year of Initiative, um, it's actually seeming like we might have a renewed focus on measuring soil water potential in situ at our flux tower sites, which could provide us with really rich and exciting new information, right, to give us a new perspective on the sensitivity of fluxes um, to soil water deficits. All right, so to conclude, um, I began with uh, some cautionary notes about ET measurements, and just remember that the data are not always data, um, that they are plagued uh, by this energy balance closure problem, and better characterization of the boundary layer may help us resolve that. Um, when we think about land cover effects on ET and temperature regimes, um, it's relatively straightforward to understand surface temperature effects, much harder to understand the effects on air temperature but again, better boundary layer characterization would be super helpful. Um, I think there's an awful lot of work to do to understand these non-local effects of land use and land cover change on cloudiness and precipitation. Um, a lot of what's been done before has relied on slab models for boundary layer height. Um, what could we learn with better data? Um, it's an exciting question to think about. And then finally, when it comes to soil moisture and VPD, uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us to better harmonize observations and models. And um, let's see if we can have the renewed emphasis on uh, getting better information about soil and plant water potential. Okay, thank you.